Hello and welcome to this course on Docker Fundamentals. My name is Mumshad Manambeth and I will be your instructor for this course. This is a hands-on beginner's guide to Docker and we will be learning Docker through some fun and interactive coding exercises. So how exactly does this course work? This course contains lectures on various topics followed by some demos showing you how to set up and get started with Docker. We then go through some coding exercises where you will practice writing Docker commands, build your own Docker images using Docker files, and set up your own stack using Docker Compose. You will be developing Docker images for different use cases, which will give you a pretty good idea on how to start creating your own images and how to share them in the Docker community. Finally, we will be taking a practice test to test your knowledge. In this course, we're going to get introduced to Docker basics, what Docker is, how to run Docker containers, how Docker handles networking, how to create a Docker image, and finally understand what Docker Compose and Docker Swarm are. This course is intended to give an absolute beginner some idea on Docker and enough information on getting started, playing around, and exploring Docker. So let's get started. Hello and welcome to this lecture on Docker Overview. My name is Mumshad Manambeth and we are learning Docker fundamentals. In this lecture, we're going to look at a high level overview on why you need Docker and what it can do for you. Let me start by sharing how I got introduced to Docker. In one of my previous projects, I had this requirement to set up an end-to-end -end stack including various different technologies like a web server using Node.js, a database such as MongoDB, a messaging system like Redis, and an orchestration tool like Ansible. We had a lot of issues developing this application with all these different components. First, their compatibility with the underlying operating system. We had to ensure that all these different services were compatible with the version of the operating system we were planning to use. There have been times when certain version of these services were not compatible with the OS and we've had to go back and look for another OS that was compatible with all these different services. Secondly, we had to check the compatibility between these services and the libraries and dependencies on the OS. We've had issues where one service requires one version of a dependent library, whereas another service required another version. The architecture of our application changed over time. We've had to upgrade to newer versions of these components or change the database, etc. And every time something changed, we had to go through the same process of checking compatibility between these various components and the underlying infrastructure. This compatibility matrix issue is usually referred to as the matrix from hell. Next, every time we had a new developer on board, we found it really difficult to set up a new environment. The new developers had to follow a large set of instructions and run hundreds of commands to finally set up their environments. They had to make sure they were using the right operating system, the right versions of each of these components, and each developer had to set all that up by himself each time. We also had different development, test, and production environments. One developer may be comfortable using one OS, and the others may be using another one. And so we couldn't guarantee that the application that we were building would run the same way in different environments. And so all of this made our life in developing, building, and shipping the application really difficult. So I needed something that could help us with the compatibility issue. Something that would allow us to modify or change these components without affecting the other components and even modify the underlying operating system as required. And that search landed me on Docker. With Docker, I was able to run each component in a separate container with its own libraries and its own dependencies, all on the same VM and the OS, but within separate environments or containers. 
we just had to build the Docker configuration once and all our developers could now get started with a simple Docker run command. Irrespective of what the underlying operating system they run, all they needed to do was to make sure they had Docker installed on their systems. So what are containers? Containers are completely isolated environments, as in they can have their own processes or services, their own networking interfaces, their own mounts, just like virtual machines, except they all share the same operating system kernel. We will look at what that means in a bit. But it's also important to note that containers are not new with Docker. Containers have existed for about 10 years now, and some of the different types of containers are LXC, LXD, LXCFS, etc. Docker utilizes LXC containers. Setting up these container environments is hard as they are very low level, and that is where Docker offers a high level tool with several powerful functions, making it really easy for end users like us. To understand how Docker works, let us revisit some basic concepts of operating systems first. If you look at operating systems like Ubuntu, Fedora, SUSE, or CentOS, they all consist of two things, an OS kernel and a set of software. The operating system kernel is responsible for interacting with the underlying hardware, while the OS kernel remains the same, which is Linux in this case, it's the software above it that makes these operating systems different. This software may consist of a different user interface, drivers, compilers, file managers, developer tools, etc. So you have a common Linux kernel shared across all operating systems and some custom software that differentiates operating systems from each other. We said earlier that Docker containers share the underlying kernel. What does that actually mean, sharing the kernel? Let's say we have a system with an Ubuntu OS with Docker installed on it. Docker can run any flavor of OS on top of it as long as they are all based on the same kernel, in this case Linux. If the underlying operating system is Ubuntu, Docker can run a container based on another distribution like Debian, Fedora, SUSE, or CentOS. Each Docker container only has the additional software that we just talked about in the previous slide that makes these operating systems different, and Docker utilizes the underlying kernel of Docker host, which works with all the operating systems above. So what is an OS that do not share the same kernel as this? Windows. And so you won't be able to run a Windows-based container on a Docker host with Linux OS on it. For that, you would require Docker on a Windows server. You might ask, isn't that a disadvantage then? Not being able to run another kernel on the OS? The answer is no, because unlike hypervisors, Docker is not meant to virtualize and run different operating systems and kernels on the same hardware. The main purpose of Docker is to containerize applications and to ship them and run them. So that brings us to the differences between virtual machines and containers, something that we tend to do, especially those from a virtualization background. As you can see on the right, in case of Docker, we have the underlying hardware infrastructure, then the operating system, and Docker installed on the OS. Docker can then manage the containers that run with libraries and dependencies alone. In case of a virtual machine, we have the OS on the underlying hardware, then the hypervisor like a ESX or virtualization of some kind, and then the virtual machines. As you can see, each virtual machine has its own operating system inside it, then the dependencies and then the application. This overhead causes higher utilization of underlying resources as there are multiple virtual operating systems and kernels running. The virtual machines also consume higher disk space as each VM is heavy and is usually in gigabytes in size, whereas Docker containers are lightweight and are usually in megabytes in size. This allows Docker containers to boot up faster, usually in a matter of seconds, 
whereas virtual machines, as we know, takes minutes to boot up as it needs to boot up the entire operating system. It is also important to note that Docker has less isolation as more resources are shared between containers like the kernel, whereas VMs have complete isolation from each other. Since VMs don't rely on the underlying operating system or kernel, you can have different types of operating systems such as Linux-based or Windows-based on the same hypervisor, whereas it is not possible on a single Docker host. So these are some differences between the two. So how is it done? There are a lot of containerized versions of applications readily available as of today. So most organizations have their products containerized and available in a public Docker registry called Docker Hub or Docker Store already. For example, you can find images of most common operating systems, databases and other services and tools. Once you identify the images you need and you install Docker on your host, bringing up an application stack is as easy as running a docker run command with the name of the image. In this case, running a docker run ansible command will run an instance of ansible on the docker host. Similarly, run an instance of MongoDB, Redis and Node.js using the docker run command. When you run Node.js, just point to the location of the code repository on the host. If you need to run multiple instances of the web service, simply add as many instances as you need and configure a load balancer of some kind in the front. In case one of the instances was to fail, simply destroy that instance and launch a new instance. There are other solutions available for handling such cases that we will look at later during this course. We've been talking about images and containers. Let's understand the difference between the two. An image is a package or a template, just like a VM template that you might have worked with in the virtualization world. It is used to create one or more containers. Containers are running instances of images that are isolated and have their own environments and set of processes. As we have seen before, a lot of products have been dockerized already. In case you cannot find what you're looking for, you could create an image yourself and push it to the Docker Hub repository, making it available for the public. Hello and welcome to this demo. Um, in this demo, we're going to see how to set up and get started with Docker. So I have a Linux host, a Debian uh, based Linux operating system. And, and uh, I'm going to uh, install Docker on this. So for that, I'm first going to go to the Docker uh, website. So I'm going to go into uh, docs.docker.com. This website provides uh, detailed um, descriptions and instructions on various concepts and topics in Docker. The first uh, tab here on the left is uh, get Docker. So that's what I'm going to do. Um, so in here we have instructions on installing Docker uh, for various uh, versions. So there are primarily two versions of Docker. Um, one is the uh, community edition and the other is the enterprise edition. So the community edition is the uh, free um, uh, edition which is available for developers and small teams and enterprise edition is designed for enterprise development. Um, so we're going to go with community edition. Um, this is the best option for a starter um, who's trying to learn and get started with Docker. So I'm going to select community edition here on the left and as you can see there are various options for installing Docker on Mac, Windows, Ubuntu, Debian, CentOS, Fedora, and, and uh, installation with other binaries. So I'm going to go ahead with Debian because that's my operating system. So I'm going to select Debian. And if you look at the instructions here, um, it's Docker uh, is supported on these three versions, uh, Strat, Strat uh, Jesse, and Wheezy. So if you'd like to find out what version of uh, Debian you're running, I'm just going to run this cat slash etc slash star release star command 
and this gives me the version of the operating system. So I'm currently using Debian and it's the Jesse version. So I'm going to follow instructions for installing Docker on the Debian Jesse version. So if you look here, the first step is to uninstall all versions if I have Docker already. So I'm just going to check if I have uh, Docker already installed. Um, I don't. So as you can see, command not found. That indicates that I don't have Docker installed currently. So I can skip that step. Um, there's an extra step needed for Wheezy, but I'm not using that particular version. So I'm going to go ahead with this. Um, so there are different ways to uh, install Docker, and I'm going to use the first one, which is installation, installation using the repository. So uh, the first step is to update, uh, run the apt get update oh. command to update uh, the apt package index. Okay, so that's complete. Um, so I'm now going to, I'm going to run the next uh, step, which is installation of some of the uh, dependent packages. So I'm going to copy that and run that. Select yes. And I'll wait for that to complete. Okay, and then the third step um, is to um, add Docker's official GPG key. So I'm going to copy this command, run that. I don't have to sudo, so I'm just going to get rid of that. Okay, so that's uh, successful. And I'm going to verify that the key ID is this test, uh, I'm going to run this command. And if you look at Docker here, get the key fingerprint. And if you were to compare it, you can see that it's the same. So we're good there. The key is the same. And then the next step is to uh, add a stable a repository, a stable Docker repository. So I'm just going to copy this command it's called add apt repository. And run that. Okay, so that's complete. Um, and then the next step is to install Docker CE. So I'm going to run the apt get update to update the list of the, the package index because I just added a new repository. And then the command to install Docker is apt get install docker ce. Select yes. Okay, so that's done. I'm just going to clear the screen and I should now be all set. So if I done run the Docker command, I can now see uh, the help message displaying. So this is, this is a good sign that Docker is installed. Um, if you go back to the documentation, it gives you, I'm just going to skip this and the, on step four, it gives you the instruction to verify Docker. So if you do the Docker run hello world command, um, it should run, it should pull down the hello world um, container and print you a hello world message. So. So there you go, it says uh, hello from Docker. This mes message shows that your installation appears to be working correctly. And you have instructions here on how to start a Docker run, uh, container with Ubuntu. So I'm just gonna copy that. And I'm gonna run that command, which is docker run-it ubuntu 
um, and bash. We'll look uh, more in uh, more into uh, the run commands later, but this is just this just shows how um, to pull uh, an Ubuntu Docker image and uh, run some test commands um, to see how the Docker works. Okay, so the uh, the new Docker Ubuntu image was downloaded and it's run. So currently, I'm actually if you look at the prompt earlier, it was root at Docker. Now it's root at uh, an ID. So this is the container ID. Um, so if I were to clear the screen, um, now I'm actually inside the Ubuntu uh, Docker image. So if I do a cat etc star release star, I can see the this operating system that I'm currently in is Ubuntu and what the version of Ubuntu. So um, if I were to exit from this container, I'm back in the Docker host. And uh, if you run the same command here, you see that this is the Debian host. So we were earlier in the Ubuntu host uh, Docker container. We're now outside on the Docker host, which is Debian. So that's a, a short, quick demo on uh, how to install Docker on a Linux host and get started. Uh, there are other instructions available on the site to install Docker on other platforms um, such as Mac and Windows. So feel free to uh, explore these options. Thank you very much. Hello and welcome to this lecture on Docker commands. My name is Mumshad Manambath and we are learning Docker fundamentals. In this lecture, we will go through some basic Docker commands that are required for anyone to get started working with Docker. Let's start by looking at the run command. The docker run command is used to run a container from an image. Running the docker run ubuntu command will run an instance of the Ubuntu OS image on the docker host if it already exists. If it doesn't exist, it will go out to docker hub and pull the image down. This is only done the first time. For subsequent executions, the same image will be used. Also remember that to pull down the image, your docker host needs internet connectivity to docker hub. The docker ps command lists all running containers and some basic information regarding them, such as the container ID, the name of the image, the current status, and a random funny name assigned to it by docker, which in this case is silly Samet. To see all containers running or not, use the dash a option. This outputs all running as well as previously exited containers. To stop a running container, use the stop command, but you must provide either the container ID or the container name in the stop command. If you're not sure of the name, run the docker ps command to get it. From the output of the docker ps command, identify either the container ID or uh, the random name assigned to the docker uh, container, and then run the docker stop command, specifying that. In this case, I run docker stop silly summit. On success, you will see the name printed out and running docker ps again will show no running containers. However, running the docker ps with the dash a option shows the container silly summit and that it exited about a minute ago. As you can see, when you run docker stop, it stops the docker container. However, the docker container is still saved on the disk. But what if you don't want this container lying around consuming disk space? What if you want to get rid of it for good? Use docker rm command to remove a stopped or exited container permanently. If it prints the name back, we're good. Run the docker ps command again to verify that nothing is listed. Now we can see that there are no containers running or exited existing on our system, which is good. But remember that we had downloaded the Ubuntu image from the Docker Hub earlier. Where do we see that and how do we get rid of that image? 
to see all the images uh, that is available to us or that we downloaded for doc from Docker Hub, run the Docker images command to see the list of images. In this case, it lists the Ubuntu image that I downloaded earlier. In case we are not using an image anymore, and to, uh, to remove that image, run the docker rmi command. The rmi command is used to remove images, and the rm command is used to remove containers. To remove an image, you must ensure that no containers are running off of it. You must stop and delete all dependent containers to be able to delete the underlying base image. When we ran docker run command earlier, it downloaded the Ubuntu image as it couldn't find one locally. What if we simply want to download the image and keep it so when we use the run command in the future, we don't have to wait for it to download. Use the docker pull Ubuntu command to only pull the image. Let's look at a little bit more about the docker run command. When you run the docker command with Ubuntu earlier, you notice that the container doesn't actually stay alive. This is because the container is the base version of an operating system, in this case Ubuntu, and we haven't actually asked it to run any script or command or a service. Since it has nothing to do, uh, as soon as we run it, it exits immediately. Docker containers are meant to run services or applications. If there isn't anything running, Docker stops the container immediately. If the image isn't running any services, as in this case with Ubuntu, you could execute something with the docker run command. For example, a sleep command with a duration of 1000 seconds can be appended to the docker run command, and in that case, uh, when the container starts, it runs the sleep command and goes into sleep for 1000 seconds. And so the container stays alive for the next 1000 seconds. We will see more examples of this in the upcoming lectures. What we just saw was executing a command when we run the container. But what if we would like to execute a command on a container that is already running? For example, when I run the docker ps command, I can see that there is a running container. Let's say I would like to see the contents of a file inside the running container. I could use the docker exec command to execute a command on my docker container. In this case, I'm executing a command on my com container infallible query, and the command is cat etc hosts. When you run this, it lists the contents of the etc host file inside the Docker container. Hello and welcome to this demo. In this demo, we're going to look at some of the basic Docker commands, um, some basic commands that are necessary for uh, one to get started and in order to play around with Docker. So in the previous uh, demo, we installed Docker following a set of instructions from the Docker documentation site. And we ran a sample uh, Docker Hello World container and a Docker Ubuntu uh, image. In this uh, demo, we're going to look at some other commands. So just to start with, um, we will run the Docker, uh, we'll start with the Docker run command. So the Docker run command is used to run a container from an image. So you need to specify an image name. Um, to find out what images you can use, go to the Docker Hub um, website and go to Explore and you should be able to see a lot of um, default uh, official images available, like the Hello World that we just saw. Let's say you would like to try a, a CentOS. Um, you, could, you could just do, if you click on this, you'll see the instructions on uh, running the CentOS. So you could simply do, as you can see here, it just says docker pull CentOS. So you could simply do a docker run CentOS. And that should uh, first try and find if there's a CentOS image available locally. If not, it's just going, going, going to go out and download the latest uh, 
image or the latest version of the CentOS image. As you can see here, uh, the name, if you simply specify a name like this as CentOS, it's going to look at uh, the library repository. Uh, our library is a default Docker repository which has the official images. So if you go to the uh, go back to the Docker Hub website, all the official images, um, such as those that are available here, can simply be downloaded with just the name of that particular image. Um, on the other hand, if you develop your own images, for example, if I go to my dashboard and I have um, some images that I use here, such as the Ansible Playable, etc., if I need to run any of these then I need to use the name in this particular format called as uh, the first with the user ID. So mmshad is my user ID and under uh, and then followed by a forward slash and the name of the repository. So this, uh, it should, uh, you should use names in this format if you are using your own images um, or uh, you could simply use the name directly, but that then these need to be official uh, repositories that are supported by Docker. So um, I have this new image uh, uh, downloaded called Docker uh, Saint OS. Now <clears throat> it's not actually going to, um, as you can see, I did, I'm back to my prompt. Um, it didn't, it, it ran, but it exited immediately, and that's because we didn't ask it to do anything. So it's just uh, the Saint OS image is just a base uh, image for an, for the Saint OS operating system. Uh, as you know, um, Docker is used to run services and applications. So if you want to keep that container alive, you need to be running something. Um, so I'm just going to um, run run it again. And this time it won't take long because the image is already pulled. Um, and I'm going to say, ask it to run the bash command. And if I want to uh, automatically be logged into the Docker container when it's run, I should be using the dash IT options. We look at what these options are in a bit. So now, uh, as you can see, the prompt has changed. So what's what's happened is Docker ran the CentOS container, which is the CentOS operating system, and then ran the bash uh, command. And then uh, it logged me in directly to the container uh, since I specified the dash IT uh, options. So I'm now inside the Docker container. If you look at this, uh, the prompt, it says root at uh, uh, an, uh, a unique ID. This is the unique ID for the Docker container, uh, whereas earlier I was at the Docker prompt. Okay, so I'm going to, um, just to uh, check the operating system that I'm on, I'm going to do a cat slash etc slash star release star and as you can see, I am on the CentOS Linux um, OS. Um, so I'm inside the CentOS. Okay, so I'm going to exit now and I'm just going to clear my screen. So that's the first command. Uh, so Docker run and uh, an image name will run a Docker container. The next command that we're going to see is the ps command. So I'm going to run the Docker ps command. The Docker ps command lists all the running containers. Um, in this case, I do not have a running container because I just ran the CentOS. I, I got I logged into that CentOS. I ran a couple of commands and then I exited, and that actually uh, took me out of the container, and the container wasn't doing running any service. So Docker exited that container. So the Docker ps command lists all the running containers only. Now I do not have any running container. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to run um, the CentOS container once again. So I'm going to say docker run send OS. And earlier I gave the bash command. Um, now I'm just going to run uh, the sleep command. I'm just going to sleep for 20 seconds. So the container is going to come up. Um, it's just going to sleep uh, for 20 seconds. And then it's just going to uh, shut down. Um, and then I want to run this in the background. So I'm just going to give a dash D so that I get back to my terminal. And as you can see, this is the container ID and it just ran, ran the container. Now, if I run the Docker PS command, I will see that this is the container ID. This is the image it's running off of. Uh, the command that is running uh, is sleep 20. So it's going to sleep for 20 seconds. It was created seven seconds ago. It's been up for six seconds. 
and it's a, it's got a funny name called flamboyant noise. Okay, now um, we we asked it to just sleep for 20 seconds, just to keep it alive for 20 seconds. So if I run the Docker PS command now, probably it should it should have gone. Yes, so it's gone because it slept for 20 seconds, and then that was the end of that command. Uh, and so since the command exited, the Docker container exited as well so because it didn't have anything to run or uh, any service running on it. Okay, so um, that's a quick example of Docker PS command. Now, uh, if you'd like to see all the containers you ran in the past um, and all the exited containers, especially, so you could do a run a Docker PS dash A uh, Docker PS command with the dash A option, and you'll see all the all the containers that exited. So uh, the last one that we ran was the CentOS with the sleep command, and it was created about a minute ago, and it uh, it exited about 54 seconds ago. Similarly, before that, we uh, ran the CentOS um, with the bash the first time, and I was on it for about three minutes checking the OS, etc and it, it was uh, created about four minutes ago. Similarly, um, you can see all the previous uh, containers that we ran. So uh, when you run a container and it exits, uh, the container actually lives uh, in um, on the disk drive. Now that we have seen uh, how to list all the running containers, let's look at another example. So I'm going to run the same command to run a CentOS, but in this case, I'm going to sleep for around 2000 seconds. And what this will mean is that my cent it'll run a CentOS container and then it'll sleep for 20 2000 seconds. Um, and so, and after that, it's going to exit. Now, if I run the Docker PS command now, I should be able to see that. So it's up for 13 seconds and it's just going to be alive for 2000 seconds. Now, for some reason, if I want to stop or kill this container right now, I could use the docker stop command. So I do a docker stop and then say uh, serene pasture. Um, I could either provide the name of the container or I could give the container ID. Um, and when I do that, it takes a couple of seconds to stop or force kill that uh, particular docker container. Okay, now if I do a docker ps, I can see that it's no longer there. If I do a docker ps-a, I will be able to see that um, the container that I just ran at the top, it was created about a minute ago and it exited about nine seconds ago. And you can see the exit code in here. So the exit code for the previous containers are all zero because they exited under normal conditions. But since I killed it using the stop command, you can see the exit code which is 137 right here. Okay, so <clears throat> now I have a lot of containers that I ran previously and I kind of want to clean it up. So what can I do to remove these containers? For that, I could use the docker rm command. So I do a docker rm. I'm gonna start with the first one. Um, I'm gonna provide this container ID. So I could either refer to the containers with the container ID or with the name right here. So in this case, I'm gonna select this one, I'm going to provide the name. So I've removed two containers and if I do a docker ps-a, I will be able to see that those are gone. So that that's what you should do to uh, reclaim uh, disk space. Similarly, I'm going to get rid of all of this. Um, now I don't need to provide the entire container ID. Um, I could actually provide just a few, the first few letters. So I say 345. And then I can provide multiple container IDs in, or names in the same command as well. So this one is 345, the next one is E0A, the next one is 773. So it's going to remove all of them um, at once. Now if I run the docker ps command, I can see that all those three are gone. So this, this is a way to remove the docker containers. Um, so I'm just going to clean clean up all that 62 and 5b 
So I don't have any containers uh, running or dead at the moment. So that's good. So I've cleaned up uh, all of that. Now, um, the image that I've pulled, uh, which is the, uh, I've actually pulled three images so far. First, the Hello World, then the uh, Ubuntu, and then the CentOS. Now, uh, to see the images that I currently have, I could run the Docker images command. Then I can actually see the images. I actually pulled another one called BusyBox, which is a really, really lightweight um, toolkit, as you can call it. Uh, it's just uh, one around 1.13 MB in size. Um, so if you want to really, you know, test something really small, you could actually use this particular image. So now what do I do to get rid of these images? Let's say I pulled these for just to test them and I want to get rid of them. I could do a docker rm command followed by the name, uh, do, sorry, docker rmi command. So rm is used for removing containers. Rmi is used for removing images. So I do a docker rmi and then say um, busybox. That removes the busybox. Then I do docker rmi and remove the Ubuntu. That removes the Ubuntu. Um, so now I have two left. And just to demo something real quick, I'm going to run a container based off of CentOS. And if I do a docker ps-a now, I can see that there's a, a, a container based on the CentOS image. Now, what it, well, the reason I did this is if I try to delete, now I can see that if I try to delete the docker um, image for CentOS using the RMI command, it'll actually fail telling me that this particular image is being used by a particular container. So we actually have a container uh, dependent on this particular image that you can see here. So um, we need to get rid of all the containers first before removing the image. So we're going to do a docker rm and 8e to remove the container and we make sure the container no longer exists and then we remove the image using docker rmi and send os and now the image is gone similarly we're going to remove the hello world image okay so um so we do not have any uh, containers and we do not have any images running at the moment um okay so uh that's uh some of the basic um docker uh, commands uh let me also show you one another uh command um which is a pull so if you do the docker pull uh, earlier when we ran the docker run command uh, with Ubuntu, um, it first looks for uh, an image locally. If not, it's going to go out and pull the image. And then it's going to pull the image and immediately run that image, uh, run a container with that image. Now, if we don't want docker to run immediately, and if we just want to pull an image and just to keep it so that later on, if we were planning to run it, um, we don't want to uh, spend time uh, pulling the image, you could simply pull the image alone using the docker pull command. So you do a docker pull and say Ubuntu, and that goes out and pulls the docker image and stores it locally on the local system. Okay, so it's pulled the image. Uh, now, if I now run the docker images command, I can see the Ubuntu image um, is there. Okay, so um, there's one more thing to look at before we end this demo, and that's uh, running a command on a particular container. Okay, so we're going to run a Ubuntu um, container. So we're going to do a docker run Ubuntu, and we're going to keep it alive for, let's say, a thousand, a uh, hundred seconds. And we want it to run in the background, so we get back to our prompt or console. So we're going to do a run it uh, in the background using the dash D, and um, so there it goes. Um, if you do a docker ps command, you can see that it's, it's running and it's um, sleeping for 100 seconds. Now, while a docker container is running like this, if you'd like to 
um, run a particular command on the, uh, the uh, on the currently executing container. For example, if you'd like to see the contents of a particular file which is inside the container, um, you might want to run a cat command on a particular file. So to run a command inside a running container, first uh, identify the container you want uh, to work with and then do a docker run, um, sorry, docker exec and uh, ex uh, provide the container ID. In this case, this is a container ID and then followed by the command that you wish to run. So I'm just going to run the cat slash etc slash star release uh, file. So I'm just going to look at the release file to uh, understand what version of the OS is running. So uh, the exec command basically runs uh, or executes and um, executes a command on a running container. When I hit this, it actually runs this particular command inside the container and gives me an output. So uh, that's basically it uh, for this demo. We just looked at some of the basic commands um, and uh, the some of the additional parameters we looked at, we're going to look, a th look at them a little bit more in detail in the upcoming demos and lectures. So this is it for now. Um, so these are some basic commands. So go ahead and play around with it. Um, thank you for your time and see you in the next lecture. Hello and welcome to this demo. In this demo, we're going to take a look at how coding exercises work in this course. After every lecture or a demo, you will be automatically redirected to this coding exercises page. So we have coding exercises accompanying most of the lectures in this course. And so there are three types of coding exercises available. Basically, uh, the coding exercises section is intended to give you a hands-on uh, practice on uh, the commands as well as developing Docker files right in your browser. So even if you don't have an actual Docker set up, system set up in your environment, you could still play around with the coding exercises section to get some hands-on experience um, on the Docker commands as well as developing your own Docker files. So there are three types of exercises, coding exercises. Uh, one is commands. And so this is how it works. Um, there are, the coding exercises section is divided into three um, panes. Um, the first one is at the top, which is your description or the question or the challenge that you're asked to address. Um, so you can see what you need to do right here. So in this case, it says type in the Docker run command to run a container based on CentOS image um, in the command file. Um, uh, below, there are two sections. The one on the left is a list of files you have. And on the right, which is the main section here, is the contents of the file you select on the left. So there are two uh, files. Um, so this file that you see here called exercise.rb is a default file um, that comes up for every uh, coding uh, exercise. However, this is not the file that you want to work with. Um, so this file can be ignored. Uh, this file just has a banner called uh, learn Docker right here. And as it says here, this file is not used. So do not type in your solution into this file. Use the adjacent YAML or command or text file instead. So um, as you can read in the question, uh, you need to type in the command inside the command file. So if you go into the uh, command file, uh, this is where you need to type in the command. So in this case, it's very simple. Um, I just have to run the docker run command and uh, the image name is CentOS. Um, going forward, you will have uh, advanced uh, tasks or advanced commands that you'll have to build on your own. So um, now once you develop your command, uh, click on the text solution button in the bottom right corner and it will give you uh, the result. So it says, well done, your solution is correct. If I had typed in uh, an incorrect uh, uh, command or something, uh, an incorrect image name in this case, and if I do a check solution, um, it tells me that there's something uh, wrong with my command. So the solution validation feature uh, checks your work and gives you uh, the results. Uh, so this is one type of coding exercise. Another type of coding exercise is uh, 
for Docker files. So Docker files are used uh, for creating your own image. Uh, so when you uh, go through the lecture for learning about Docker files or creating uh, on how to create your own image, that's where uh, you will come across this kind of uh, exercises. So in, in this case, uh, I have a new file called Docker file, which is empty and I'm asked uh, to develop or uh, write uh, the instructions needed to build uh, my own Docker image. So in this case, it reads um, add an instruction to start from a base Ubuntu image and remember to use the image version 17.10. So um, I'm going to have to uh, write down the, uh, do prepare the Docker file. So in this case, it's called from Ubuntu 17.10. And when I click on check solution, it checks that and uh, tells me that it's correct. So I can proceed um, in the next uh, step. Um, it asks me to uh, update and add a run instruction onto the docker file to update the apt packages so i'm going to add a new instruction or run and i'm going to say apt get update click on check solution and that is correct um, going forward so this is a third type of coding exercise in this exercise uh, this is when you will uh, go through the docker compose lecture so docker compose uses uh, yaml files for uh, building docker stacks so docker compose uses yaml files as its configuration file so you have a yaml file already here called docker compose.yaml uh, so the instructions start simple and it goes um, and it gets advanced. So in here, uh, there's already a, a Docker file created for you, which with a single service called web. And um, uh, our task is to update the Docker compose to add a new database service named database and use the MySQL image for it. So in this case, I'm going to add a new service uh, here called database and I'm going to specify an image name and the image name is MySQL and when I click on check solution it checks my solution and verifies that it is correct similarly I'm going to go to the next one and here the task is to add a deploy dictionary to the web service and so I'm just going to add that and um, uh, add some replicas which is five and click on check solution and it verifies my solution. So that's basically, that's just an introduction to um, how uh, coding exercises work in Udemy. Uh, so this is a great way to get some hands-on experience uh, before working in an actual um, product or project um, based on Docker. In case you are not able to find out the answer to any of the questions, feel free to ask, uh, raise, a, raise your hand and uh, ask a question by clicking on this browse Q&A button here on the bottom left. Um, and then uh, uh, for, the, for the questions, uh, if someone has already raised a question, you'll see that here. So feel free to browse through that. Uh, but if there are no questions here, or if there are, if there are no questions for your um, a query, then uh, feel free to ask a new question. And I will try and apply to it as soon as I can. And uh, another thing that I'm going to do is um, I'm also going to add mm, a link here um, with an answer key that will take you to a GitHub repository where you can find answers to uh, these questions. So that's another uh, way to um, get answer to your questions. So um, that's about it. Um, thank you very much for your time and I hope you have a good time uh, working with coding exercises in this course. Hello and welcome to this lecture on Docker Run. My name is Bumshad Manambet and we are learning uh, Docker fundamentals. In this lecture, we're going to look more into some of the advanced features while running a Docker container. Let's take a deeper look at Docker run command. 
We learned that we could use the docker run ubuntu command to run a container in the previous lecture. In this case, the latest version of Ubuntu. But what if we want to run another version of Ubuntu, like for example, the version 17.04? Then you specify the version separated by a colon. This is called a tag. Also notice that if you don't specify any tag as in the previous command, Docker will consider the default tag, which is latest. I'm now going to run a Docker image I developed for a simple web application. The repository name is mmshod forward slash simple web app. It runs a simple web server that listens on port 5000. When you run a Docker run command like this, it runs in a foreground or in an attached mode, meaning that you will be attached to the console of the Docker container and you will see the output of the web service on your screen. You won't be able to do anything else on this console other than view the output until this Docker container stops. It won't respond to your inputs and you won't be able to do anything else on this terminal. If you need to stop the docker container, open another terminal and stop the container using the docker stop command. To get around this, run the docker container in detached mode by providing the dash d option. This will run the docker container in the detached mode and you will be back to your prompt right after you run the command. If you would like to attach back to the running container in the foreground, run the docker attach command and specify the name of the docker container, in this case, sad ramanujam. Let's look at another option. I have a simple prompt application that when run asks for my name and on entering my name prints a welcome message. If I were to dockerize this application and run it in uh, as a docker container like this, it wouldn't wait for the prompt. As you can see in the output, it didn't actually wait for the prompt. Instead, it went right ahead and printed a custom message with an empty name. That's because by default, the Docker container does not listen to a standard input. You must map the standard input of your host to Docker container using the dash i parameter. When I run the same docker run command with the dash i parameter, the docker container now listens on the standard input of my docker host, which is the keyboard in my case. And, and so it waits for a prompt and on entering the name, it prints the right welcome message. Let's look at port mapping. Let's go back to the example where we run a simple web application in a Docker container on my Docker host. Remember the underlying host where Docker is installed is called Docker host or Docker engine. When we run a containerized web application, it runs and we are able to see that the server is running. But how does a user access my application? As you can see, my application is listening on port 5000, so I could access my application by using port 5000. But what IP do I use to access it from a web browser? There are two options available. One is to use the IP of the Docker container. Every Docker container gets an IP assigned by default. In this case, it is 172.17.0.2. But remember that this is an internal private bridge network IP and is only accessible within the Docker host. So if you open a browser from within the Docker host, you can go to the URL http 172.17.0.2 colon 5000 to access the IP address. We will talk about networks and bridge networks more later in the networking section. But since this is an internal IP, users outside of the Docker host cannot access it using this IP. For this, we could use the IP of the Docker host, which is 192.168.1.5 in this case. 
But for that to work, you must have mapped the port inside the Docker container to a free port on the Docker host. For example, if I want the users to access my application through port 80 on my Docker host, I could map the port 80 of the local host to port 5000 on the Docker container using the dash p parameter in my run command like this. And so the users can now access my application by going to the URL http 192.168.1.5 colon 80 and all traffic on port 80 on my Docker host will get routed to port 5000 inside the Docker container. This way you can run multiple instances of your application and map them to different ports on the Docker host. or run instances of different applications on different ports. For example, in this case, I'm running an instance of MySQL database that runs a database and listens on the default MySQL port 3306, or another instance of MySQL on another port 8306. So you can run as many applications like this and map them to as many ports as you want as long as you have free resources and ports. And of course, you cannot map the same port on the Docker host more than once. If I try to run another Docker container for MySQL and map it to the same port on the Docker host, which is 8306, I'll get an error message that that particular port is already allocated. We will discuss more about networking later on in the network uh, lecture. Now let's look at how data is persisted in Docker containers. For example, let's say you were to run a MySQL container. When databases and tables are created, the data files are stored in a location forward slash var lib MySQL inside the Docker container. This is where the MySQL Docker containers store the, its data by default. Remember that the Docker container has its own isolated file system and any changes to any files stay within the Docker container. Let's assume you dump a lot of data into the database. And what happens if you were to delete the MySQL container and remove it? As soon as you do that, the container along with the data inside it gets blown away, meaning all your data is gone. If you would like to persist your data, you would want to map a directory outside the Docker container on the Docker host to a directory inside the Docker container. In this case, I create a directory called forward slash opt forward slash data dir on the docker host and map that to the var lib mysql uh, directory inside the docker container using the dash v option specify the directory on the docker host followed by a colon and the directory inside the docker container this way when docker container runs it will implicitly mount the external directory to the folder inside the Docker container. This way, all your data will now be stored in the external volume at opt data dir, and thus will remain even if you delete and get rid of the Docker container. The next time you run the MySQL container, simply provide the same volume mapping. All your data will be available to the MySQL container. Head over to the exercises and practice some commands with tags, attach, std in, port mapping, and volume mapping. Hello and welcome to this demo. Um, in this demo, we're going to look at uh, some of the advanced options 
with Docker commands, some of the advanced options available with the with running um, Docker containers using the Docker run command. So in the previous uh, demos, we saw how to install Docker and how to set it up and how to run some images. And we saw some of the basic commands, such as um, the commands to run a Docker container, to look at the list of running and dead Docker containers, to execute a command inside a Docker container, etc. In this case, uh, in this demo, we're going to look a little bit more about running Docker containers, but some advanced options available for us. So I'm just going to run the docker ps command to check if there are any existing running containers and I see there are no containers running. And earlier we saw that we could run an Ubuntu um, or a container based off of an Ubuntu or a CentOS by running the docker run Ubuntu command. So I'm just going to run docker run Ubuntu and I'm going to append a command next to this Docker run just so it runs the uh, when it runs or starts up the Ubuntu container and before it exits, uh, it can run this particular command and give me the output. So what I want to do is I want to see the version of Ubuntu uh, running. So um, we we downloaded our Docker downloaded an image of Ubuntu automatically, but I don't know what version of Ubuntu it is running. So I'm just going to run this uh, append this particular command to the end of the run command. So um, cat etc slash forward slash star release star and um, so it ran the docker container uh, ran this particular command and gave me this output and as you can see the version is 16.04 but what if I want to run another version of this particular uh, operating system so the first thing that I need to do is go to the docker hub site identify the repository I'm using and if you look inside this particular repository, in this case Ubuntu, you will see a list of supported tags. So that's the first thing in the description. So supported tags and um, respective Docker files. So these are the tags that it supports. For example, uh, 16.04 is actually the, the default and the latest. As, as we know, if you don't specify any tag, it's going to assume that uh, it's going to assume a latest tag. So since we didn't specify any tag when we ran the docker ubuntu command right here, it actually assumed to be the latest tag, which is why it downloaded the 16.4 image. Now what if I want to run another version, let's say 17.10. If I want to run this particular version, what I could do is just append this tag to the, ubuntu, uh, the name of the uh, image. So I'm going to run the same command as before, which is docker run ubuntu um, I'm, al I'm also going to print out the version of the os using the cat uh, command and right here i could append a tag so the tag is to be appended following a colon and if you look at this list here it could either be 17.10 um, it could be artful dash and then this particular number here or it could be artful or it could be devel it could be any of this. So these are all supported tags for the same version, which is 17.10. So I'm going to just give 17.10 for now. And it's first going to find out if that image is available locally. It's definitely not. So it's going to go out to Docker Hub and find out the image. So it's going to download the image from Docker Hub. And okay, so it's downloaded the image and run it. And when it ran, it ran the cat command to print out the version of Ubuntu. And as you can see, the version of Ubuntu is 17.10. So it's downloaded the right version because we provided a different tag. Um, so that's, that's about tags. This way you can tag your images um, uh, differently for different purposes. You can tag, you can use tags for versioning, uh, etc. The next thing that we're going to do is uh, we're going to see um, attach and detach modes. Um, so um, as we did before, I'm going to run a Docker container uh, with Ubuntu. And uh, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to um, keep it alive by using the sleep command. So I'm just going to uh, run the sleep command and keep it alive for let's say uh, a thousand a uh, hundred seconds now okay I'm just going to change that to 
um, 15. Okay, now when I run this, what I expect is uh, for Docker to run a container based off of Ubuntu and uh, run this particular uh, application. In my case, this app the application is just a sleep command. So it's going to run the sleep command for 15 seconds and it's going to exit the container. Now, if I hit enter, I can actually see that I'm I'm kind of stuck in that console. I don't see anything. If I do a control C, it doesn't actually take me out. I'm kind of stuck and I'm not, uh, I cannot come out of this particular, uh, this particular uh, console until the uh, OS or the container automatically exits, which it's done now. So uh, it waited for 15 seconds and it kind of exited. Now, if I were to run an actual application instead of the test sleep command that I ran here, such as running a web server, which uh, is supposed to stay alive um, uh, permanently, then I wouldn't be able to come out of this um, and it, the console would just show me the output of that application I'm running. Now, this is the default way how a container runs. Um, it doesn't really matter. You could always use another session or terminal to your Docker host. For example, I'm going to run the same uh, command, but in, in this case, I'm going to add two zeros to keep it alive for 1,500 seconds. Now, in this case, as you can see, if I hit Control C, whatever I try to do, it doesn't actually come out of that is because uh, the Docker containers is running in the foreground. And what I could always do is I could uh, establish another duplicate connection to my uh, Docker host. And once I'm logged in, I run the Docker PS command to see the running images. And then I can actually stop that if I want to um, by using the Docker stop and specifying the container ID. So this stops my container and if I go back, it takes a couple of seconds to stop and as soon as it stops the container, I should be back to my console uh, right here. So as you can see, um, uh, when I stopped the container from here, I'm actually back to my prompt right here. It isn't actually anything, to, um, anything of a serious concern, but uh, the next time you run the Docker um, container, if you'd like to run it in the background or in a detached mode, you could actually specify the dash D uh, parameter. So the dash D parameter is used to run it in the detached mode in the background um, when, when it starts. So as you can see, it's listed, the, this is the actual container ID, the unique container ID. Um, and so this means that it's actually successful in running. Now, if you run the docker ps command here, you can actually see the information about the container. So if you look at this right now, this is the container ID, um, unique container ID. It's actually this big, but when you see it here, it just takes the first uh, few characters um, and, and displays that here. So um, it's running the docker uh, in, in the detached mode now and um, I'd like to uh, attach back to it, so I'm going to do a, uh, for, and for that you could actually do a docker attach and then specify the container ID. And this will get you back to the docker, uh, uh, this will bring docker process container uh, and run it in the foreground. Now I'm back to the same situation again uh, because uh, it's currently, I'm, I'm actually attached to the docker container and nothing actually works, so I'm going to go back to the other host um, and I'm going to stop, I'm sorry, I'm going to go back to the other terminal on the same host and I'm going to stop the Docker container. Okay, so I'm back um, to my prompt here. Okay, so I'd like to show the same example with another Docker image. For example, I have another Docker image called timer, uh, which simply prints the time, the current time into onto the screen every second. So I'm going to run that image. And as you can see, it prints the time uh, on the screen every second. Now this runs infinitely. Uh, so this Docker container never stops. It just keeps printing the time onto the screen um, infinitely. Now. Uh, since I'm running it uh, without any additional parameters, it runs in the foreground or in the attached mode. If you'd like to run it 
in the background run it with the dash d parameter and if you go back run the docker ps command you'll see that it's running but you cannot actually see the output so if you run the docker attach command and provide the container id and you're back to the console of the docker container and you can see the output uh, being displayed okay so let's explore some additional um, docker images from docker hub so well, something that i'm uh, interested in is jenkins so jenkins is uh, as you might know already is a um, build uh, system um, and uh, so let's say if you wanted to try uh, a new application like this, uh, in fact, this is my favorite way of trying out any application. So Jenkins is a continuous integration and delivery server. And um, if I haven't worked with it before, and if I just want to uh, play around with it, get, get some hands-on experience on it, instead of going through the installation instructions and installing a lot of dependencies on my underlying host, uh, what I would like to do is simply run um, Jenkins as a container and just play around with it that way. So if you look at uh, the site here, you can see instructions on running Jenkins. So the repository name is just Jenkins and that, sh that should get you started. So um, the ideal way, uh, what, so what we have seen until now is simply running containers like this called Jenkins. And it should go out, pull uh, the Jenkins images and layers and um, uh, run an instance of Jenkins. Now, as you know, Jenkins is a web server. So what we are expecting is uh, once we deploy uh, this particular container, we're actually expecting to go to a website, uh, to uh, a browser and browse to this Jenkins server and access the web UI. So let me just go back. Uh, we'll wait for it to pull down the image. Okay, so uh, it's just finished pulling the uh, image and as you can see, it's extracted and um, Jenkins is actually running. So it started Jenkins and it's actually running. Um, okay, so uh, all I did was uh, run a docker run Jenkins command and it just pulled down the Jenkins latest version of Jenkins and ran it. Now, how do I access it? Um, so if I go to the, um, if I go to my uh, the UI of my host so this is my docker host and um, I actually um, this is the same uh, host where I have a terminal here and this is just the UI uh, UI of that host now what I'm going to do is if I run the docker ps command here I'll be able to see that it's Jenkins is running and it's on port 8080 and 50,000 now as we discussed in the lecture there are two ways to access uh, the web uh, uh, this particular application on the web UI. One is using the internal IP and two is using uh, by mapping a port uh, to uh, the my docker host and accessing it using the external IP. Now to access it using the internal IP you need to be inside your docker host which is where I am. Uh, this is the user interface for my uh, Debian docker host. So if I open up a browser um, uh, and uh, go to the IP address. So what IP address should I be using here? Um, so it should be the internal IP. Uh, to find out the internal IP of the Docker container, let me go back here. So if I run the Docker ps command, I see the container. And to find out the internal IP of my Jenkins container, I could use the Docker inspect command. So to run the Docker inspect command followed by the container ID. And when I do that, I actually see uh, a lot of information about uh, my Docker container, the status, the image that it's using and all of that. And if you scroll down um, in the network section, under networks, you'll see that it's using the bridge network. We'll talk about networks um, in a bit. Uh, um, but uh, right here, if you look at the IP address, you can see the IP address here. So it's 172.17.0.2. So this is the IP that I would use if I were to access this Docker container from inside my host. So I'm gonna go back to the UI 
for my host and I have a Firefox running. Enter the IP 172.17.0.2 followed by port 8080 and I'm actually at uh, on the Jenkins uh, page. So um, and then I, I, I follow the instructions that I have here so if you look uh, at the output uh, after you run the docker run command you will be able to see that uh, there's an uh, there's an admin user uh, has been created and the password generated automatically so i'd be using this password um, to unlock and uh, start configurations on the jenkins but um, as you can see we're on this we are on the web page uh, by using the internal ip so that's good now um how do i access it externally so if i open a um a web page so if I open a web page and go to um, the IP of my uh, docker host which is 192.168.1.14 and if I try to access the Jenkins uh, server using that IP address I won't be able to access this is because um, that particular port or service is not listening on the docker host now in order to do that as we saw in the lecture you need to add a port mapping so you cannot add a port mapping while the server is, uh, is running, so you have to stop. So I'm going to try and stop the Docker container. And if you do a Docker PS, I see that it's no longer running. And I'm going to run use the same Docker run command. And in this case, I'm going to map the port 8080 to the port on the Docker host. And I'm going to run it again. And if I go back to my browser and refresh, I should now be able to see um, the Jenkins page. Okay, cool. So I can just follow the instructions uh, right here and um, uh, get started with it. So that's really cool. So I don't, ha I didn't have to. Um, you know, install dependencies or follow a, a lot of a set of instructions or, or install uh, binaries, etc., um, to get uh, or get started with Jenkins um, or any application like that. It's as easy as running the Docker container for that particular application. So we have done uh, port mapping, and if you look at um, this instructions right here it also gives you instructions on mapping a volume this is because as you can read here uh, jenkins will store the data in your home uh, directory on the host so by default jenkins stores the data in var jenkins home inside of the uh, jenkins container and if you want to save that information you need to map a volume so just to sh uh, demo that here i've uh, i've actually provided the the password and I've, I've set the initial password and, and I'm just going to install it and set it up real quick so I'm going to install suggested plugins and it's going to take uh, a few minutes for it to install uh, some of the default plugins so I'm just going to give it give it some time so all that I'm trying to do here is I'm just trying to make some configuration changes on my Jenkins you know setting it up is a configurational change uh, setting a password uh, etc or you know uh, installing plugins are all configurational changes so I want to see if the changes that I make uh, will live if I were to uh, stop the container and restart it or uh, remove uh, the Jenkins container and run another instance of Jenkins and will I be able to still see the differences that I made. Okay, so it's installed all the default uh, plugins and I'm going to create a first user. So I'm going to create an admin user, uh, provide a password. Uh, provide a full name and an email address and we'll save and finish okay so I'm all set Jenkins is ready and I'm gonna start a job um, I'll do uh, I'll add something like um, enter an item name for example test job or something and I'm going to select uh, a freestyle project and click OK
Okay, so if I go back to the my homepage um, on Jenkins, I see that there's a test job created. So I have made some configurational change. Now, if I go back and stop my container, and if I do a Docker PS, I don't see any container running. And if I refresh this page, I see that it's gone. Okay, now if I were to rerun another uh, container using the same command and so it comes back saying Jenkins initial setup is required and um, Jenkins is fully up and running so if I go back to the browser and refresh the page now this is uh, since I ran the docker run command uh, so it's a new container that's running and obviously uh, we're back to square one where we're uh, uh, asked to set up an initial administrator password and we'll have to do all everything that we just did all over again now um, in order to persist that data across docker containers or across docker container um, restarts or uh, even if you destroy docker containers and uh, run a new container and if you'd like to persist your configuration data um, as you can see here in the instructions you've got to map a volume and this is the same for uh, MySQL uh, database or anything like that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, create uh, a local directory called um, my Jenkins data and what I'm going to do is when I run the docker container next time I'm going to map that volume which is root my Jenkins data to the location where uh, doc, uh, where Jenkins Docker container stores its data by default. That's under Jenkins home. So I'm going to put that <clears throat> and I'm going to run. Um, so there's a permission issue. There's um, you have that instruction here. So we could use dash u and specify another user. I'm going to start it with the root user. Okay, so since this is the first time um, we're mapping a directory, uh, we're just going to go back and we'll have to do everything once. So I'm going to copy this password. I'm just going to quickly redo what we just did before. And I'm going to create a new job. Okay, so um, I've set up Jenkins and I've created a test job. Now I'm going to go back and stop this container. And as you can see, uh, there's no container running. And unlike before, I'm going to rerun the same command, but this time I'm going to map the directory, my local directory, into Jenkins home. Okay, so this time it's um, fully up and running. And if I refresh my Jenkins page, instead of going to the initial page where we are asked to enter uh, the initial admin password, I'm actually asked to log in. So I'm going to log in with the user that I created. And once I log in, I'm able now to see the test job that I created before. So that shows that uh, all the custom data that is being um, generated by the Docker container is actually stored locally on my Docker host. And so every time I run a new uh, instance of Jenkins, I could just map that folder and um, all, all the configuration data will be picked up by Jenkins when it runs the Docker container. So that shows uh, how to map a port and how to map a volume on an actual um, Docker container. Uh, it's a real life um, example of using Docker with Jenkins. So that's about it uh, for now.
Uh, thank you very much for your time and uh, see you in the next lecture. Hello and welcome to this lecture on Docker images. My name is Bumshad Manambet and we are learning Docker fundamentals. In this lecture, we're going to see how to create your own image. Now before that, why would you need to create your own image? It could either be because you cannot find a component or a service that you want to use as part of your application on Docker Hub already, or you and your team decided that the application you're developing will be dockerized for ease of shipping and deployment. In this case, I'm going to containerize an application, a simple web application that I have built using the Python Flask framework. First, we need to understand what we are containerizing or what application we are creating an image for and how the application is built. So start by thinking what you might do if you want to deploy the application manually. We write down the steps required in the right order. I'm creating an image for a simple web application. If I were to set it up manually, I would start with an operating system like Ubuntu, then update the source repositories using the apt command, then install dependencies using the apt command, then install Python dependencies using the pip command, then copy over the source code of my application to a location like opt, and then finally run the web server using the flask command. Now that I have the instructions, create a Docker file using this. Here's a quick overview of the process of creating your own image. First, create a Docker file named Docker file and write down the instructions for setting up your application in it such as installing dependencies, uh, where to copy the source code from and to, and what the entry point of the application is, etc. Once done, build your image using the docker build command and specify the docker file as input, as well as a tag name for the image. This will create an image locally on your system. To make it available on the public Docker Hub registry, run the docker push command and specify the name of the image you just created. In this case, the name of the image is my account uh, name, which is mmshot, followed by the image name, which is my custom app. Now let's take a closer look at that Docker file. Docker file is a text file written in a specific format that Docker can understand. It's in an instruction and arguments format. For example, in this Docker file, everything on the left in caps is an instruction. In this case, from, run, copy, and entry point are all instructions. Each of these instruct Docker to perform a specific action while creating the image. Everything on the right is an argument to those instructions. The first line from Ubuntu defines what the base OS should be for this container. Every Docker image must be based off of another image, either an OS or another image that was created before based on an OS. You can find official releases of all operating systems on Docker Hub. It's important to note that all Docker files must start with a from instruction. The run instruction instructs Docker to run a particular command on those base images. So at this point, Docker runs the apt get update command to fetch the updated packages and installs required dependencies on the image. Then the copy instruction copies files from the local system onto the Docker image. In this case, the source code of our application is in the current folder and I'll be copying it over to the location opt source code inside the docker image. And finally, entry point allows us to specify a command that will be run when the image is run as a container. When docker builds the images, it builds these in a layered architecture. Each line of instruction creates a new layer in the Docker image with just the changes from the previous layer. For example, the first layer is a base Ubuntu OS followed 
by the second instruction that creates a second layer which installs all the apt packages and then the third instruction creates a third layer with the python packages followed by the fourth layer that copies the source code over and the final layer that updates the entry point of the image. Since each layer only stores the changes from the previous layer, it is reflected in the size as well. If you look at the base Ubuntu image, it is around 120 MB in size. The APT packages that I install is around 300 MB and the remaining layers are small. You could see this information if you run the docker history command followed by the image name. When you run the docker build command, you could see the various steps involved and the result of each task. All the layers built are cast, so the layered architecture helps you restart docker build from that particular step in case it fails, or if you were to add new steps in the build process, you wouldn't have to start all over again. All the layers built are cached by Docker. So in case a particular step was to fail, for example, in this case, step three failed and you were to fix the issue and rerun Docker build, it will reuse the previous layers from cache and continue to build the remaining layers. The same is true if you were to add additional steps in the Docker file. This way, rebuilding your image is faster and you don't have to wait for Docker to rebuild the entire image each time. This is helpful especially when you update source code of your application as it may change more frequently. Only the layers above the updated layers needs to be rebuilt. We just saw a number of products containerized, such as databases, development tools, operating systems, etc. But that's just not it. You can containerize almost all of the application, even simple ones like browsers or utilities like curl, applications like Spotify, Skype, etc. Basically, you can containerize everything. And going forward, I see that's how everyone is going to run applications. Nobody is going to install anything anymore going forward. Instead, they're just going to run it using Docker. And when they don't need it anymore, get rid of it easily without having to clean up too much. Head over to the exercises and practice creating your own Docker files. Hello and welcome to this demo. In this demo, I'd like to show how to create our own Docker image for an application that we have. So first I'm going to um, explain a little bit about my application. So I have a simple web application which is based on Python Flask. Um, it's on my GitHub page. It's a really, really simple application uh, that just, uh, you know, uh, gives prints a message um, onto the screen. So how do you actually um, deploy this application? Um, so there are some dependencies first. Uh, for example, there are some Python dependencies and then, and then you install the web application dependencies like Flask and the Flask MySQL uh, Python dependencies. And then you basically run your application using the Flask command. Um, and finally, just go to the, uh, once it's up and running, go to the web, uh, go to the browser and access the IP of the host where it's running on and go to the 5000 port and you'll see a welcome message. So it's it's a simple application. If you, if you ask, how are you? It's gonna come back saying, I'm good, how about you? I'm going to show the code. Um, it's just one single app.py file. And if you look at this file, um, all you have is a, a simple route, which is the default route that returns welcome message and then another URL um, how are you that returns another message. So it's a really simple um, web application. So first I'm just going to show how to uh, deploy it uh, manually. So uh, what I'd like to do is <clears throat> I don't want to install anything on my Docker host. Just I don't want, uh, I just want to keep it clean. I don't want to install some dependencies now and then, you know, uh, remove it later. So since I have Docker already, the easiest uh, way to go about this is to start with um, 
some kind of a base operating system. Okay, so I'd like to start with the base operating system like uh, Ubuntu, since I already have it, uh, the image pulled. So I could run a Docker run Ubuntu, but what I want to do is I want it to stay alive and um, I want to work on it, uh, work on that particular container. So I'm going to append a bash command. So it runs the bash, uh, bash command when it starts the container. And I'm going to map the um, standard input using the dash i parameter and the terminal using the T. So this way, as soon as um, the Ubuntu image starts and it runs the bash command and it, it takes um, or it attaches my input uh, and terminal to that particular container. So that basically um, runs the command, runs the container and connects me onto that particular container, which is all I want for now. And as soon as I exit the container, um, the, the image is going to stop. So this is all I want for now, just to play around and test my application. So I have my Ubuntu uh, image running and what I'm going to do is I'm going to follow instructions in my in setting up my simple web application. So the first thing to do is install Python. So um, I'm not going to install the remaining dependencies there. I'm just going to install Python. So I'm going to run apt-get install Python. Uh, it cannot locate the package Python. That's because you have to run, you have it run the apt-get update to update the package index. Okay, so um, I've run that and now I'm going to run um, and try and install Python. Okay, so it's installed Python and if I run Python command, I can see that uh, Python 2.7 is installed, which is good. Okay, so I'm good with that. So the next step is to install flask. So I'm going to use pip install flask. So pip is not found. So I need to uh, install pip first. So I'm, I'm going to do apt get install python pip. Okay, so pip is installed and I'm now going to install uh, the flask dependency for my web application using pip. Okay, so that's uh, that's installed and it's successful. So I can now uh, run my web server um, using the flask uh, flask run command. But for that, I need the source code, of course. So I go uh, to my source code, and all I'm going to do is um, I'm just going to copy the source code of the application and create it here. So. I'm going to put the source code in forward slash opt forward slash app dot py. I'm going to paste the source code there. I'm going to follow the instructions here to run the application, which is this. I'm just going to copy that and run it. Okay, so it's inside opt folder. So I'm going to go there. And we'll run that again. So as you can see, um, my app, my Flask application is currently running. Now, how do I access my web server? So if you remember, when I ran the Docker container using the Docker run command, I haven't actually mapped a port to my Docker host. Um, and so the only way to access my application is to go in um, to the host and access it from a web browser inside my host. So I'm going to uh, go here and I'm going to go into the 172.17.0.2 uh, IP and I'm going to uh, access the port 5000 because it's 5000 on which my web server is listening. And when I run that, I can actually see the welcome message come right here and you can actually see some output uh, here as well. Another URL that we talked about was how are you. So I'm just going to say how are you in the URL and it's come back with the message and good, how about you? So, so that's working, so my application is working. So this is how I set up my simple web application. Now, how do I dockerize it? Um, let's go back, I'm going to quit the application. I'm going to, uh, I, I've actually got the instructions ready. So uh, the first thing to do is, uh, whatever you need to containerize, first um, go over the basic uh, install steps. So try to do it once manually. 
and then note down the steps required. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to open a notepad and write down the steps that I followed. For example, the first thing that I did is apt get update. So I'm just going to run the history command and pull down all the instructions from that. And then I ran the apt get install Python. And then um, I ran pip install flask, but I, I had to have Python pip for that. So I'm going to copy pip from here. So this is going to be my next command. And then followed by pip install flask. And then I created my app application file at app.py. So I'm just going to write it down here. Create or copy application code to opt app.py. And then finally I ran my flask application using this command. And this should actually be opt app.py. Okay, so this is all that I need uh, to install and set up and run my application on a new host, on, a, on, a, on an Ubuntu host. So I have the instructions ready. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to exit out of this container and back to my uh, Docker container. I'm going to run Docker PS and I see there are no containers running. Um, so uh, as we saw in the lecture, the first thing to do is to create a Docker file. So I'm just uh, before that I'm going to create a directory called um, my custom app, or right, I'll say my symbol web app, and I'll create all the files, uh, all the, all the Docker files inside this particular directory. So uh, the first thing that I need to create is a Docker file, so I'll call it Docker file, and um, what I did here is if I look at my instructions, the first thing is um, uh, before I run the update command, as we saw in the instructions in the lecture, uh, the first instruction should always be, be from. So I'm going to start from an Ubuntu based operating system. Okay, so I have the instructions here and I'm, I have my Docker file here. So I'm going to start with uh, Ubuntu and then I'm going to install, I'm going to run the uh, apt get update command, apt get update. Then I'm going to run apt get install dash y, dash y is required so it doesn't actually wait there uh, waiting for your prompt. Um, and then I could do both in this command, I could install python and python dash pip in the same command. And then I need to um, run the flask, installing the flask dependency. So I do uh, pip install flask. And then this is where I need to copy my source code of the application um, from my local directory to the Docker container. So I use the copy um, instruction and then I say copy app.py. So this, this would mean I, this is assuming that I have my app.py in my local directory, which I don't have for now, but after, as soon as I finish uh, creating the Docker file, that's what I would do next. So I have my app.py, and then I want it to be copied to opt app.py inside the Docker container. And then finally, um, the application, uh, co the code to run the application, that would go in entry point. So I'd say entry point is, um, and just copy the command to run my application. So that's basically it. Um, before I run, uh, try to build it, I need my um, application code in the same directory. So I'm going to create a app.py here and copy the application source code. Um, so I'm all set. Um, I could now run the docker build command. So I do a docker build dot and it's going to start building the image. So I already have Ubuntu. So the step one out of six uh, was completed immediately because it didn't have to go out and pull the image. Step two is running apt get update and that's you can see the output of that particular step right here. 
Similarly, um, you will be able to see output of all the um, instructions on the screen. Okay, so it's finished uh, building my image. And as you can see, all the steps are complete. Step five out of six, six out of six is complete. And finally, it successfully built my um, image. So um, if you look at the command, I haven't actually specified a name for the image. So I'm just going to run it again and I'm going to give a tag. Um, I'm going to say my uh, simple web app. And now, uh, since it's already built, it's just going to uh, go through that real quick because it doesn't have to rebuild uh, the whole image again. Um, as we discussed uh, in the lecture, whenever Docker builds an image, uh, it builds yeah. and caches each layer. So all the layers are cached and uh, I don't really have to, if, even if I rebuild the image without any changes, it's just going to build real quick and it's not actually going to go through the whole build process. So um, now I have my new uh, image. So if I run, if I just clear my screen and run a Docker image, sorry, Docker, Docker images, I can see uh, my new image right here. And so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to run that uh, by running the Docker run and providing my symbol web app. And as you can see, it started and it's uh, listening on 5,000. So if I go inside my uh, host, and if I go to that particular URL, I should be able to see that it's listening and it's working. Okay, so that's good. And uh, uh, I could also map it, map a port and access it from my Docker host. Okay, so um, I have my simple uh, web app image. Now, how do I push it to the Docker uh, hub and um, make it available to the public? So once I have my application ready, um, I could push it to the Docker hub by uh, running the Docker push command. Now before that, uh, you should have tagged your application uh, with your repository. So if you do a docker push my simple web app, um, it says requested access to the resource is denied. This, uh, the reason is uh, by default, if you didn't specify an organization in your uh, name, it's going to try and push it to the default um, organization which is called library or the default um, account which is the library and um, not everybody has the permission to push it to that account that's only for uh, default docker supported official uh, repositories so you can only push to repositories under your own account so first uh, what we need to do is we need to build the image and tag it with our uh, not just the name directly, but you need to tag it with your account name. So you're going to do a docker build once again. And in this time, you're going to tag it with your account name. In this case, my name is Mom Shad, and you're going to tag it with your application name. Okay, so if, we, if I do a docker images, I can see that that's, I've created a new image. And then now I do a docker push and provide that repository name, the image name. Uh, it says uh, request access, requested access to the resources denied if you haven't logged in. So there's a prerequisite, which is to log in. So you do a Docker login first, uh, provide your uh, user account. So my user account is this, and I'm going to type in my password and login succeeded. Okay, so that's good. Now, if I run the push command again, it will push uh, my image to the Docker Hub. Okay, so my application is now pushed to the Docker Hub. So if I go to Docker Hub, <clears throat> and if I go to my dashboard, if I'm logged in with the user, I will now be able to see my application right there. So if I look at, uh, at the bottom, I see my symbol web app, 
and if you go inside it you should be able to see and you have the command here on how to pull and run this particular um, application that's about it that's available now on public and if you actually want to make it private you can actually do that uh, but with your free account on docker hub you can only have a one of uh, private repositories okay so once it's there uh, any user anywhere in the world can actually pull down your image uh, your container and run your uh, application with a simple docker run command okay so um, that's about it in this demo we looked at how to create our own simple docker image so uh, go ahead and practice for yourself create your own images containerize your applications um, and push them to docker hub thank you very much uh, for your time and uh, we will meet in the next lecture Hello and welcome to this lecture on Docker Compose. My name is Mumshad Manambeth and we are learning Docker fundamentals. Earlier we saw how to deploy a stack using Docker run command. Now you could use the Docker command if you want to deploy a test container or set up a development environment and play around with containers etc. Now, you wouldn't use Docker run commands in a production environment to set up your stack, especially if you have uh, large applications with a number of services that are interacting with each other. Instead of running separate Docker commands to set up your environment, a better way to do this is to define your configuration in a Docker compose file. A Docker compose file is a file in YAML format where you define the different services involved in your application, such as web, database, messaging, orchestration, etc. Once the file is defined, it is easy to bring up the entire stack by running the docker compose up command. In case you haven't worked with YAML files before, please check out the introduction to YAML uh, module at the end of this course in the appendix section. The module provides a brief overview of YAML and some practice coding exercises on getting started with YAML. Go through that lecture first and come back here. In case you are already good with YAML, feel free to continue with this lecture. Let's take a closer look at the Docker Compose file. The Docker Compose file is a YAML file with a dictionary named Services. It has a list of services defined in a key and value format. The key is the name of the service. This could be anything you want to name your service. In my case, I have a two tier application, a web and database tier. So I named my services accordingly. The value of each service must be a dictionary with a minimum specification of an image. The image could be an image previously built or available on Docker Hub. My web image is a custom image I built with a repository named mmshot forward slash simple web app. And my database tier uses MySQL image. Running the docker compose up command will bring up the two containers as I specified in the docker compose file. However, we have a problem. As discussed previously, an end user cannot access the web application if you don't map its ports to the Docker host. We know that we could do this in command line. If we were to run the container using the docker run command, uh, we could specify the port mapping using the dash p parameter that we saw earlier. But in this case, we are not using the docker run command. Instead, we have our configuration defined in the docker compose file and we're bringing up the application stack using the docker compose command. To map ports of a container in docker compose file, specify a ports property in the service properties and add the port mappings you need for that container. In this case, I have a new property called ports inside which I have a list of port mappings. Each mapping is in the format a port on the docker host colon the port on the docker container. This way I can add multiple port mappings for separate services. 
Similarly, we also learned that we could map a volume outside of the Docker container in the Docker host to a location inside the Docker container. Uh, in case of MySQL, to preserve the database data, that is what we did earlier. And we used the dash V parameter in the Docker run command. To add volume mapping information into Docker Compose file, use the volumes property and specify a list of volume maps. In this case, I have a property called volumes under the database service, and I have one volume mapping where I'm mapping the directory opt data in my Docker host to a, the directory varlib mysql inside the mysql container. Running the docker compose up command will now provide me with a working web application stack. You could use docker compose stop to stop the containers and docker compose down to bring down everything and remove the containers entirely. Head over to the coding exercises section and create your own Docker Compose files. Hello and welcome to this lecture on Docker Swarm. Uh, my name is Mumshad Manambeth and we are learning Docker fundamentals. This is an advanced topic and is out of scope for this beginner's guide, but we will just go through and understand it at a high level. Up until now, we have been working with a single Docker host and running containers on it. This is good for dev test purposes, but we wouldn't want to use this configuration in a production environment because this is a single point of failure. If the underlying host fails, we lose all the containers and our application goes down. This is where Docker Swarm comes into play. With Docker Swarm, you could now manage multiple Docker machines together as a single cluster. Docker Swarm will take care of placing your services into separate hosts for high availability. Setting up Docker Swarm is easy. First, you must have hosts with Docker installed on them. You must designate one host to be the master or the Swarm manager and the others as slaves or workers. When you're ready, run the Docker Swarm init command on the Swarm manager and that will initialize the Swarm manager and provide the command to be run on the workers. Copy the command and run it on all the worker nodes to join the manager. After joining the swarm, the workers are also referred to as nodes. You are now ready to create services and deploy them on the swarm cluster. Let us start by using the same Docker Compose file we used earlier. Now to deploy multiple instances of a service across Docker hosts using swarm, add a new property to the image called deploy and specify the number of replicas required in it in this case, 5. To run the application, execute the docker stack deploy command and specify the docker compose file name. This will deploy 5 instances of application across docker hosts. There are some additional steps required to configure load balancing, but those are out of scope for this basic course. Hello and welcome to this lecture on Docker networking. My name is Mumshad Manambeth and we are learning Docker fundamentals. When you install Docker, it creates three networks automatically, bridge, none, and host. Bridge is the default network a container gets attached to. If you would like to associate the container with any other network, specify the network information using the network command line parameter like this.
Let's talk about each of these networks a little bit. The Bridge network is a private internal network created by Docker on the host. All the containers attach to this network by default and they get an internal IP address, usually in the range 172.17 series. The containers can access each other using this internal IP if required. To access any of these containers from the outside world, you must map ports of these containers to the Docker host as we have seen before. Another way to access the containers externally is to associate the containers to the host network. This takes out any network isolation between the Docker host and the Docker container, meaning if you were to run a web server on port 5000 in a web app container, it is automatically accessible on the same port externally without requiring any port mapping as the web container uses the host network. This would also mean that, unlike before, you will now not be able to run multiple web containers on the same host on the same port, as the ports are now common to all containers in the host network. With the non-network, the containers are not attached to any network and doesn't have any access to the external network or other containers. So we just saw the default bridge network with the network ID 172.17.0.1. So all containers associated to this default network will be able to communicate to each other using the internal private IP address. But what if we wish to isolate the containers within the Docker host? For example, the first two web containers on in the internal network 172 series and the second two containers on another internal network 182 series. By default, Docker only creates one internal bridge network. For this, we would create our own internal network using the command docker network create and specify the driver, which is bridge in this case, and the subnet for that network followed by the custom isolated network name. Run the docker network ls command to list all networks. And in this case, you will be able to see the newly created custom isolated bridge network. That concludes the Docker beginners course. We covered the real basics of Docker, understood the various concepts such as the architecture, what containers and images are. We saw how to install and get started with Docker and how to run containers in different ways. We also looked at how to create your own image and practiced developing some Docker files ourselves. We also went at a high level on Docker Compose and Docker Swarm. That's it for this beginner's course and I will hopefully develop an advanced course on Docker covering some advanced topics. I hope this was a good learning experience and you have uh, enough to get started on your Docker journey. So thank you very much for your time. Please leave a review and share this course with your friends eager to learn Docker. Also, feel free to check out the other courses in the DevOps series on Ansible. Until next time, happy learning and happy containerizing. Hello and welcome to this lecture. My name is Mumshat Manambeth and we are learning Docker fundamentals. In this lecture, we'll be looking at YAML files. This is basically an extra lecture. This is for those who haven't worked with YAML files in the past and this lecture along with the coding exercises should help you get started with YAML files. All Docker Compose files are text files or configuration files rather that are written in a particular format called YAML. If you have worked with other data structure formats like XML or JSON, you should be able to easily pick it up. Don't worry if you haven't worked on any of these, you should still be able to easily pick it up going through the coding exercises that accompany this course. A YAML file is used to represent data, in this case configuration data. Here is a quick comparison of a sample data in three different formats. The one on the left is XML, where we display a list of servers and their information. 
The same data is represented in JSON format in the middle and finally in YAML format to the right. Take a minute to compare the three formats. Let's take a close look at YAML. If you take the data in its simplest form, such as key value pair, this is how you would define it in YAML, key and value separated by a colon. The keys are fruit, vegetable, liquid, and meat, and the values are apple, carrot, water, and chicken. Remember, you must have a space followed by a colon differentiating the key and the value. Let's take a look at how an array is represented. We would like to list some fruits and vegetables. We would say fruits followed by a colon. On the next line, enter each item with a dash in the front. The dash indicates that it's an element of an array. How about a dictionary? A dictionary is a set of properties grouped together under an item. Here, we try to represent nutrition information of two fruits. The calories, fat, and carbs are, are different for each fruit. Notice the blank space before each item. You must have equal number of blank spaces before the properties of a single item, so they are all aligned together. Let's take a closer look at spaces in YAML. Here we have a dictionary representing the nutrition information of banana. The total amount of calories, fat, and carbs are shown. Notice the number of spaces before each property that indicates these key value pairs fall within banana. But what if we had extra spaces for fat and carbs? Then they will fall under calories and thus become properties of calories, which doesn't make any sense. This will result in a syntax error which will tell you that mapping values are not allowed here because calories already have a value set which is 105. You can either set a direct value or a hash map. You cannot have both. So the number of spaces before each property is key in YAML. You must ensure they are in the right form to represent your data correctly. Let's take it to another level. You can have lists containing dictionaries containing lists. In this case, I have a list of fruits and the elements of the list are banana and grape. But each of these elements are further dictionaries containing nutrition information. A lot of students new to YAML have reached out to me asking when to use a dictionary or a list. So let me explain this a little bit better. First of all, it is important to understand that all of what we discussed so far, such as XML, JSON, or YAML, are used to represent data. It could be data about an organization and all of its employees and their personal details, or it could be data about a school and all of its students and their grades, or it could be data about an automobile manufacturing company and all of its cars and its details. It could be anything. Let's take an example of a car. A car is a single object and it has properties such as color, model, transition, and price. To store different information or properties of a single object, we use a dictionary. In this simple dictionary, I have properties of the car defined in a key value format. This need not be as simple as this. For example, in case we need to split the model further into model name and make year, you could then represent this as a dictionary within another dictionary. In this case, the single value of model is now replaced by a small dictionary with two properties, name and year. So this is a dictionary within another dictionary. Let's say we would like to store the name of six cars. The names are formed by the color and the model of the car. 
To store this, we would use a list or an array as it is multiple items of the same type of object. Since we are only storing the names, we have a simple list of strings. What if we would like to store all information about each car? Everything that we listed before, such as the color, model, transition, and price. We will then modify the array from a list of strings to a list of dictionaries. So we expand each item in the array and replace the name with the dictionary we built earlier. This way, we are able to represent all information about multiple cars in a single YAML file using a list of dictionaries. So that's the difference between dictionary, list, and list of dictionaries. I hope you understood the difference between the three and when to use each of these. Before we head over to exercises, let's take a look at some key notes. Dictionary is an unordered collection, whereas lists are ordered collection. So what does that mean? The two dictionaries that you see here have the same properties for banana. However, you can see that the order of properties, fat and carbs, do not match. In the first dictionary, fat is defined before carbs, and in the second dictionary, carbs comes first followed by fat. But that doesn't really matter. The properties can be defined in any order, but the two dictionaries will still be the same as long as the values of each property match. This is not the same for lists or arrays. Arrays are ordered collection, so the order of items matter. The two lists shown are not the same because apple and banana are at different positions. This is something to keep in mind while working with data structures. Also remember, any line beginning with a hash is automatically ignored and considered as a comment. We are now ready to head over to the coding exercises and have fun playing with YAML files.